Thank you for joining the Judaism Demystified podcast. We are very pleased to have Imu Shalev, who is somebody who means a lot to me and to Bensi. Uh, we've been listening to Aleph Beta for many years now. My wife got me into it. And I just wanted to know the other narrator, you know, behind all the amazing illustration, illustrated shiurim. So I want to ask you if you could tell our audience a little bit about your story, how you got into this, your upbringing and everything. Sure. I'd be happy to. First of all, thanks for having me. Super happy to be here. Um, my background, I grew up in the five towns. I don't know if you ever heard of it, um, <laughs> but I, I grew up in a place called Lawrence. Um, I attended uh, DRS Yeshiva High School. Um, I went to uh, KBY in Israel um, and I went to Yeshiva University and then um, I went to YU. So that's my background. Very, I think, stereotypical modern Orthodox grew up uh, from. Um, and I guess, hmm, where should I begin? <laughs> uh, I could tell you how I got to Aleph Beta. I could tell you a little bit about um, my background spiritually. Do you have a preference as to where you want me to start? Uh, background spiritually, maybe? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I'll tell you, like, I, I grew up modern Orthodox, um, but for me, I was always really interested in being a good Jew. Like, I was, I had a very uh, typical good boy uh, attitude, but the problem was that it was really difficult for me to actually be perfect. That was really, like, a, a really important thing that I wanted to do. And so, I'm like, this is stupid stuff. Like, in yeshiva in Israel, it was hard for me to wake up for minion. Or my kavana wasn't perfect, or I didn't stay out as late for night seder as all the other guys did, and so I became obsessed with motivation. I was convinced that if I knew why, um, why we needed to do the things that we did, then that would somehow, you know, help me show up a little better or be inspired. And simultaneously, I, I was also really struggling with a a Judaism that told me to do the right things, but but not why. So, um, uh, you know, for example, in in high school, the emphasis was always on learning Gemara, but we would spend years studying, you know, a, a takana about a, a get that uh, if you have to say, befanei nechta, befanei nechtam, you know, and just like some weird things that were worried that maybe this thing might happen. And I know, no one explained to me how this is connecting me to God or how this was spiritually meaningful in some way. Or in Yeshiva, we were studying Cheska Sabatim, like squatters' rights. No one explained. And then there, there were these side lectures where somebody would say something really inspiring every once in a while. Sorry. Just got a phone call that I silenced. Sorry. Okay. You got me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Um, yeah, every once in a while, like there'd be a chug or uh, some a guest speaker would come in and say something inspiring. And that was like my my Jewish experience. But along the way, you know, I had a lot of really good friends who had challenges. Like I had a few friends who um, were gay and nobody had anything to say to them. Nobody could explain to them like what their role was and how they fit in. Um, I, all my chavrusas in KBY are no longer from all of them. And wow. KBY is like a big yeshiva like it's a i mean in modern orthodox spaces like that's where you'd want the best guys to go um my roommate in yu is no longer from my closest friends like i, I have a friend who basically knew uh sanhedrin by balpe and he's not from um whereas i'll tell you that guy who i'm, I'm still friends with i feel like he's more spiritually on the same page as i am than the people that I daven next to in shul. So I, I had these feelings like um, there's a Judaism that is very focused on practice and very focused on intellectual gymnastics and very, very focused on halacha. And then there's the Judaism of hashkafa. There's the Judaism of values and the Judaism of meaning and never the twain shall meet. Right? That that was sort of my, my background. And I had to do a lot of self-education to figure out exactly. I, so I really admire the work that you guys are doing because it really feels like so much of what you're doing is really delving into the why of what we do and building like a uh, hashkafic foundations and, and, and right. Like th that's, I think a lot about what you guys are trying to do, which I, I love. Thank so you. I was a uh, kind of a, a self uh, learner for a long time. 
Um, and then I guess, you know, my professional journey is um, at YU, I was the director of the Maccabees, the acapella group, oh, as wow. part of their uh, starting cohort. Um, and um, I wrote the first, uh, that first video that went viral, Candlelight, I wrote the lyrics together with uh, David Block. Um, and that sort of changed my trajectory. I, I was going to law school um, and something, I mean, this is something that's kind of, um, some people don't love when I say this, but it, it is true for me. I was kind of embarrassed by the success of the Maccabees. Um, and it's because we had a lot of people who wrote in saying that they were really inspired by the music and they were really inspired by, you know, uh, whatever it was they were inspired by. They were saying they were lighting Hanukkah candles for the first time in 20 years, or they were uh, inspired to keep Shabbos for the first time and, you know, whatever it is. And I was embarrassed because I wrote that song so that we could get more bar mitzvah gigs for our acapella group. Like that's, that was the intention. <laughs> And it's not the most meaningful of songs, right? Like it, it doesn't, there's no substance to that song. So like along the way, you know, I, I'm really thankful and grateful for my uh, journey on, in, in Maccabees. And, you know, we traveled all over the world and um, to the uh, chagrin of my bandmates, I would always give introductions at the, uh, in concerts that were more like Divrei Torah. So I used that platform, mm -hmm. but I was really enamored by the power of online video to share a message like that. I got bit by that bug in law school. And I sort of realized, whereas most of my friends were becoming Rebbeim and going into Chinuch and, and they're going to stand in front of 30 kids every year and do their thing. You could have a platform where you're reaching thousands by leveraging, you know, online media or in Maccabees case, millions. So I jumped. I was supposed to be a lawyer and I found this job opening at Aleph Beta. And I was like, great. These are some people who are trying to teach Torah through online video. That's where I want to be. Um, and and at, the time, at the time when you joined was Aleph Beta, how, how they were one year in, right? They weren't uh, so established. Yeah, they were one year in. It was um, it was basically Rabbi Foreman wasn't even on payroll. <laughs> And it wasn't even clear that Rabbi Foreman was going to be the guy behind Aleph Beta. Um, but uh, there was a video editor. <laughs> so I was hire number two. Um, but uh, yeah, so so I was really excited about that. And I thought it would be a really great place to do what you guys are doing and what I did kind of in my own education, which was to kind of be a little bit of a mosaic artist, like grab you know, this really inspiring teacher over there, you know, uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, Rabbi Akiva Tatz, mm -hmm. you know, Rabbi Foreman, let's put them all together on a platform and use video to basically, you know, spread, I think what was missing for me in my Jewish up upbringing. That was my original goal in Aleph Beta. I never expected to fall in love with Rabbi Foreman. Um, and he totally changed my, uh, my Judaism. He changed my relationship with Torah and Torah text, and he changed my relationship with God. And wow. yeah, that, before that's... we before we even go for, I want to know more about that. I want to explore that. But before that, I want to know what drew you to Alf Beta in the first place, because they weren't those things before you joined. So why did you kind of dive in, leave like law school for this? What was it about them that attracted you? And the fact that Robert Foreman wasn't really on payroll. It wasn't like. He would, yeah, it wasn't Rabbi Foreman that attracted me so much, although it wasn't not. I, I'll tell you a little more about that. But back in 2012, the Jewish world, so I, I, the, the, to, to me, the Maccabees success, I think was, it, it showed me that like the Jewish world is always 20 years behind, right? Like the Maccabees didn't do anything special. We copied someone else's music and someone else's music video. And it went viral because there was nothing like that in the Jewish space. Now, unfortunately, we plagued the world with, you know, 10 years of parodies for every holiday. But um, the I think that's true in the nonprofit space as well, like and in the Torah space, like nobody really was using online video to do much of anything, you know, 10, 11 years ago. Now the space is a little bit more um, saturated, but even now it's not, it's not like, uh, it's expensive to use, to do video and to, to understand the platforms well. So 
for me, I was a big YouTube nerd. I all my whole college, I was just obsessed with YouTube. I understood YouTube really well. I've been to Vid, VidCon. I understand, you know, the algorithm and when the algorithm changes, how to do different things on the algorithm. So I was tempted to kind of do something that nobody else was doing and try and share Torah using, you know, my YouTube nerdiness. Like that was really all it was. And I thought that Aleph Beta would be a platform to let me do that. But it, it, it ended up not being the case. I ended up falling in love with her by Forma's mission rather than, you know, Aleph Beta being a platform for Emu to, you know, force his particular brand of Judaism down other people's throats. Like, did it, thank God it didn't work out that way. So do, do you feel initially, because you were kind of thrust into this, um, you know, putting out content, did you feel like kind of like an imposter syndrome kind of in a way where you you're putting out content and Rabbi Foreman's putting out content. You're like, who am I to put out this kind of content? Because even myself, when I'm interviewing people who are, you know, major scholars, I feel almost embarrassed to talk to them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I wasn't putting out any content for the first three years at Aleph Beta. I think like the what I brought to the table was sort of the producer, director, Malacha. Um, and I think that was the big value add, which was you know, like back in 2012, great rabbis would, you know, you'd stick a, a, an MP3 player on the stender and that was, you know, how they would release audio. Like they didn't edit, they didn't figure out what's my hook, what's my big question, what's my conclusion, what's my takeaway, what's my road mapping through the piece. So I was kind of contributing some editorial skill um, in the early days. Now, here's where I actually think like, the magic of my relationship with Rabbi Foreman has a lot to do with my shortcomings, which is that I was not sufficiently humble. Like I was, I was super arrogant to sit across <laughs> from Rabbi Foreman and say, well, that was nice, but you could make it shorter. Like really people are, they don't have the attention span, right? Like that, that actually the gumption to sit and do that. And, you know, like on the other hand, like we talk about my arrogance, but his humility to sit and take it from me. Right, because he did. He actually sat and listened to me, um, and he said, "Okay, you know, how can I satisfy that? How can I make it shorter? How can I make it tighter?" Which is like the best thing I ever got was uh, mentorship from from a sage, essentially. Amazing. Well, I just want to tell you the the when you were mentioning about earlier on when you were learning Gemara and how you know you didn't feel very connected through it. I I can totally resonate with that. So my, my out, because <laughs> I would feel the same things the way I went about it was I went heavy into mysticism because just like you were saying, you know, you know, we wanted to know, like, you know, how do we connect to God? <laughs> like, you know, and we're learning Gemara and it's like, you know, sometimes you're not, you, you don't, you don't know where that's supposed to take you or how you're supposed to, you know, go with that and, and have a religious experience with it per se. And, so I was telling you that. Yeah, everyone's telling you Gemara is Chachma Lokis, and this is the thing you should do, and you feel really guilty because for some reason it's yeah. not like getting you super into it. So, you, oh, okay, so it's too bad. You'll just have to learn mysticism like some poor jerk, you know. Like <laughs> if you were really, you know, uh, a holy person, then you know Cheskas Abatim would do it for you. Cheskas Abatim is wonderful, by the way. But you know, you know what I'm saying. Of course. How did you? How did you end up doing the Parsha experiment? How did that come about? I think that was your first like your entryway to, to doing videos for Aleph Beta, which I saw every single one, by the way. Thank you. Wow, that's really flattering. I appreciate it. Um, how did we get into Parsha Experiment? There's like 11 ways I can answer that question. Look, in the beginning, I was, uh, I'll say this, nobody ever intended for me to learn Rabbi Foreman's methodology. Um, in the beginning, Aleph Beta sort of existed to share Rabbi Foreman's material far and wide. And it still exists for that reason, um, you know, in part. Rabbi Foreman, I think, like many experience his Torah in a way where they're blown away. That was my experience. Like when I sat down for the first time and I was like, okay, Rabbi Foreman will be one guy amongst many at Aleph Beta. I, I read his book in one sitting and and was blown away. This is The Beast um, That Crouches at the Door? The Beast That Crouches at the Door. Um, that was his his first book. And I didn't know it at the time, but it blew me away on two levels. On the one hand, it blew me away because I was like, this rabbi is incredible. I've never learned from somebody who makes me feel this way. But on, on the other level, which I don't think I, I knew well enough at the time, is that this Torah is incredible. I didn't think that the Torah 
could ever have such relevance for me. Um, and that's a little bit why the Parsha experiment was born, because after a few years of learning with Rabbi Foreman and being his editor, Rabbi Foreman sort of accidentally taught me and David Block the methodology. No one intended for that to happen, but it is what happened. And so we sort of took on a second mission at Aleph Beta, which is not only to get Rabbi Foreman's Torah out there, but if it's possible for other people to learn this methodology, to spread this methodology to as many people as possible, help others see the incredible things in Torah texts that he was seeing. And the Parsha experiment was uh, an attempt to at least show the world that, you know, this was possible, that there's there's more than one person who could practice this kind of Torah learning. You know, it's interesting because when I first came across the videos, you know, my wife was like, you got to see this, you got to see this. And my first impression was like, oh, this is like some cartoon and it's not going to be for me. And <laughs> I, reading kind of like the summaries where where it was just very shot based, I'm like, eh, because shot, we were always kind of taught that like, it's not the Pnimio Tatora. It's not the, right. you know, the, the, there's mystical secrets and all that. So you kind of ignore the shot, which is really the most important thing. And actually the danger of it is that if you kind of skip to the to the Pnimiut, sometimes you get a very different message than the actual shot. And it's actually the opposite message sometimes. So what was fascinating to me was that, wow, you know, what what Rabbi Foreman is doing is he's actually not inventing something new. He's he's just presenting, you know, Midrashim and all these amazing things like that we learned in yeshiva in the way it was supposed to be taught, which is the, the Gaonic tradition, right? And the Maimonidean tradition, which is to explain the, the, the um, didactic kind of lessons behind um, all of these things and connecting it to the pshat in a brilliant way and kind of taking us into the minds of of the of Chazal and I kind of want to you know he probably wouldn't like me doing this but I, I I compare him to like a modern day Abarbanel because he's a fantastic uh, you know just gen generator of questions he asks amazing questions. The answers aren't always there, but that's natural. But the questions that he asks are just phenomenal. And you kind of get lost in, in even when you're reading his book, you're like, okay, but he's asking too many questions in a row and I, we need to get the answers. And it's, it's kind of, he keeps going and going and it's just an amazing thing. So I just wanted to- Yeah, the, that the questions, uh, that is um, a really deceptive part of Rabbi Foreman's methodology because uh, I I also thought, I remember I was saying, you know, Rabbi Foreman, we need a piece on Vayikra. And he's like, I don't have anything on Vayikra. I was like, don't worry, I'm going to list some amazing questions for you. And he's like, "What? that's not going to do anything for me. Like questions don't help me with anything. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You start with your questions. He's like, no, I do not start a piece with my questions. Where Rabbi Foreman begins by noticing something in the text, right? He, he notices something sticking out, a leading word, a pattern. And he pulls and he pulls and he pulls on that thread until it goes someplace that he realizes, oh, this explains finally why, you know, uh, uh, Chazal learn out the 39 malachos from uh, the building of the Mishkan. Right now I finally get it. He works backwards in a way. He works backwards in a way. He, he not in a way he works backwards. Yeah, he, he does. Works, he, works backwards. I see. The way it works is is, is it's almost like an, an, if an Aleph beta video is questions, body, conclusion. The way we do things is we work on the body, then the conclusion, and the last thing we do is the introduction. We we actually think what questions did we answer by noticing the things that we've noticed, and Love then we'll that. go and ask Absolutely. all of our questions. Love but the, what. What, what you should get out of that, though, which is an interesting thing, is that if you try and attack the Torah and demand that it give you answers, the Torah hides from you. It actually will not give you answers. If you choose to read the Torah on its own terms, and it, and it sort of tries to seduce you, you'll start to see answers to questions you've always had in the back of your mind. Mm -hmm. That's that's sort of the way the Torah encodes its meaning. If you show up to the, you know, the tree of knowledge, which is classically where we spend much of our time. And you say, what is, I, how did God put this tree here? I can't believe this. This is so mean. I don't really like this God, you're right? And the, you're, you can judge the story, but you're not going to get much out of it. But if you pay attention to the fact that, you know, uh, Adam and Chava are both uh, a room, they're naked, and the snake is a room, the text is nudging you a certain way, right? It's not an accident that, you know, um, nakedness and cleverness are sort of the same word, 
right next to each other. The text wants you to think about the themes of nakedness. It wants you to realize that right after they eat from the tree the, the of knowledge of good and evil, then the, the consequence of that is, you could have said it, if, if I were finishing that sentence off, I could have said, well, they judged each other, they hated each other, they were very powerful, but the it's they realize they're naked and then they they have shame, right? So nakedness is, is a major theme of the story. And then God comes and gives them clothing. So paying attention to how the Torah um, is trying to have you read it is far more important than asking the big questions. On the other hand, I'm a big fan of asking the big questions. It's just not always the best way to get the, have the Torah give you its answers. So it sounds like you kind of you kind of have like a like a writer's room where you guys kind of like you know break each other's heads and try to figure out you know you're trying to figure out where where do you want to take this like what kind of script you're going to build. Um, so that's fascinating because I would never know that by watching this. I, I would I would have just thought he's he's giving a Dvar Torah and he's just expanding on it. So this is actually taking us into a whole new universe. You know, it's very yeah. No, that that is it, it is not it is not easy to put those pieces together. The research. Uh, takes many weeks on its own and then the presentation is a whole other animal and also takes many weeks uh, to be able to presentation you mean by narrating and the video yeah so research is basically just like those are like sheer documents like they're outlines that basically say what did i see in the text what do i think it all means and and what's the progression of how how i, how I put those pieces together basically like evidence so yeah. intertextual parallels or chiasms or the noticings, we call them noticings internally. It's a list of that. And that could take weeks um, to put something together like that and, and follow them all through. Because sometimes you'll see something and it'll take you in different places and you got to stare at it multiple ways or learn it through with other chavrusas. So that's one whole malacha. And then another malacha is how do we present this? How do we... So that's the, the other part of Aleph Beta is we're not just a research institute. Part of our mission is to help people fall in love with Torah, but to do that in a way where the medium is just as powerful as the message. So right, that's why we got into cartoons in the first place. It's why we were online. That, that's part of the original bug that I got bit by, Like, which is I kind of want people to know how awesome the Torah is. And you can't do that if you talk for hours and hours you don't have anything interesting to say and you don't have a hook and you don't have an outro because in 2023, when we're recording this podcast, we're competing with Netflix. We're competing with TikTok. You know, like you have to have something that stands up to the quality of the content that's out there because no longer, right, are people showing up hostage to your sheer, you know, at the at shul, right? Like you have that, that 20 minutes on Shabbos, but that's it. So um, that's why we, we focus heavily on presentation and we try to make things that are a joy to listen to and a joy to watch. I think I think that the medium is the message. Was it Marshall McLuhan who, made, who had that quote? I forget who it was, but it's, a, it's amazing because what you guys have done is, like you said, you're tapping into like what the modern um, consumer is, is you know, going to be attracted to, whereas people like myself and other, you know, podcasters or other rabbis who are putting out content, they're just thinking about the next rabbi who they're competing with. You're, you're thinking about Netflix. And that's actually the right way to think about it. That's how you get out to, you know, the masses. Um, or and, far inferior to Netflix. But... Of course, of course but, but you're, you recognize that that's, that's who you're, you're competing for their eyeballs. And I yeah. think also one of the things that you've done, which to me is, is, amazing. It's, I think it's probably the biggest part of your success. And is the one part that I mentioned, you know, in the beginning kind of was a little off-putting for me, which was the cartoons, the illustrations, because, you know, the movie industry is kind of failing because, or the theater industry, because people are, you know, going to watching on Netflix and all these shows, yeah. but, but it's the children's movies that Pixar's and the Disney's that are constantly selling. Still striving. Out. Right. Because, because it, you're already drawing in automatically two people because children have to go with their parents to the theater. Yeah. So, so when you're putting out content that's that's you know illustrations, I can watch a, a, a video and then my kid passes by and is like, oh, what are you watching? That's happened a bunch of times, and that wouldn't happen if I was watching anything else. So yeah. I, I wanted to know, you know, was that like by design from the beginning, or did you guys originally think about putting just videos out there, just like rap, the rabbi talking? 
It was never the rabbi talking. The original inspiration for Aleph Beta was actually one of the board members was super into Khan Academy. And he bought Rabbi Foreman um, a tablet um, and said, look, mess around with this, watch these Khan videos. And again, to Rabbi Foreman's credit, who was, he's super tech savvy, was like, I could try this. And he, that, that first series that he did was um, Genesis Unveiled. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it. But uh, it's it's yeah. th the the art there was done by Rabbi Foreman himself, right? <laughs> like him coloring on the screen, uh, grabbing clip art from the web. Uh, that 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 was all him, and it worked because a at the time it felt like super advanced and like techy. Um, B, we really do care about the widest audience possible. Um, so you don't. We don't really want you to see Rabbi Foreman's face. We don't want you to see my face. Like, I don't want everybody to know that I'm wearing, you know, a black T-shirt and a sweatshirt. You know, like, that's, that's, you, I want you to assume, you know, that maybe I'm wearing a white shirt and black pants, if that's your thing. And, or, you know, maybe whatever it is, like, I, I have a long beard. So the idea behind the, the cartoons is, and is really just so that you can't really know who we are and what we look like, and you pay more attention to the substance of what it is we're saying. Mm -hmm. um, the other part of it is is just like, yes, we're reaching kids, we're reaching adults. Hopefully, we're not turning off adults with with too many cartoons. But I remember um, one of the best compliments I ever got was from a guy who was pretty drunk at a um, at a smorg at a wedding. He came up to me and he's like, you know, Emu, I just want to tell you, Aleph Beta is so great because you make learning Torah painless. Right. And I was like, what a uh, cynical but awesome compliment, because he was um, articulating something that many of us feel, uh, you know, and don't I don't feel like we can say. But Torah learning is sort of that thing we have to do that our God expects we do. But boy, is it painful. And <laughs> Aleph Beta's contribution was, you know, like Novocaine. Right. We're, we're making it painless. Uh, hopefully, you know, if you stick around long enough, we're making it joyful. But like, I'll tell you this. If I had all the money to retire, I would show up tomorrow and do my job, right? Like Aleph Beta is a dream job. Learning with Rabbi Foreman is a dream job. And learning this Torah is incredible. Um, but th I, that's a testament to Rabbi Foreman, like, and to the Torah, the Torah, I think. So, well, you're, you're very humble, I think, is a testament to you as well. And I, I actually think that what the videos accomplish and also putting the psukim on the screen, underlining them, showing the intertextual. Very important, very important. And the fact that they're short, all of that. And like, even if you're doing like one Parsha, you might divide it into different segments so that it can sink in. Because what happens is that like, I've used your content when I give shurim many times and I'm like, wow, it really just like stuck in my mind. Like it's in my head. I actually can repeat this. Like that, that's something that you guys should be very proud of because I, you normally would sit through an hour shiur and I'd be like, wow, that was a great shiur. And my wife would be like, what did you learn? And I'd be like, uh, <laughs> let me think about it. It'll take me yeah. like maybe two minutes to tell you. To, but this is like, I can give a full shiur. And I, when I'm reading that, I have a printout with me. You guys have all these like printouts for like different, you know, for teachers. Um, it's just like, you guys are, you created Khan Academy, right? Univers a university for Torah teaching and Torah learning. So I, I really, kola to you. you. And I, I don't even that. think it's limited to Jews. I think that your your audience can can go beyond Jews and even to I think anyone who loves the Bible, I think has what to gain from Aleph Beta. I really yeah. do. I yeah, actually, but half our audience, I would say, is Christian. Um, and, and that's something we hear from a lot of our Christian users is that they didn't realize how much of the Torah's meaning is encoded in its language, like how important knowing Hebrew is. Um, and that's something we were sensitive to in the beginning. We didn't know who our audience was. Um, and we wanted to be accessible to people who did or didn't know Hebrew. We thought like, you know, maybe less affiliated Jews, but it ended up because we translate everything attack, uh, attracting a big Christian audience that now has access to the Hebrew through our material. So yeah, that, yeah that's yeah, exactly you, right. You guys, that's not a small thing. That's not a small thing at all. And I think yeah. you guys also, you know, the fact that to me, Rabbi Foreman, if anyone who hasn't watched the episode that we've had with Rabbi Foreman, please check it out. It's wonderful because what he does is that he basically um, 
dismantles the whole, you know, documentary hypothesis and biblical criticism just by proving that there are way too many coincidences when you're looking at the text, you know, the way he does, that you, okay. you, can't, you can't just, it can't just be some hodgepodge of different things interwoven together. Um, and I think what, you know, a Christian listener would appreciate that because they're constantly, you know, under attack for, you know, you know, what is the, what does the text actually mean? What is it, you know, is it, is this, is this the original? So now they can actually go in, read the Hebrew, learn the Hebrew, and they can appreciate it as well. I think to me, that's probably the part that stood out the most. I wasn't expecting that kind of uh, presentation from a foreman and I was just blown away. So, and, and by the way, just that, just, you know, that episode or by foreman didn't go to work one day and said, how do I disprove the Bible critics? Right. What happened was we were learning in the office, like we were, were dealing with voracious Peric Aleph and voracious Peric Bays and noticing that there's two creation stories, right? Just if you're, if you're a good reader of this text, it's upsetting that, you know, the Bible starts in chapter one and it seems to restart in chapter two. Um, with a different God, right? Elohim is is in chapter one, and Yudke Vavke Elohim is in chapter two, um, and so you can you know take off your kippa and convert to uh, uh, atheist, or you can read this text and say the editors, you know, either some cabal of editors were lazy and decided to stup this stuff together, and you know, or you can say you know maybe this was intentional, maybe this was written with a purpose, and or by Foreman shows is that those chapters are interwoven together. I don't have to repeat this. You can go listen to the, that episode, but they're interwoven together so elegantly that it, it's nothing but, you know, majestic and intentional. Mm -hmm. um, and so then he was like, oh, look, I accidentally answered the Bible critics. Like that's, that's how we work typically. So was there anything that you kind of like in the beginning, you were skeptical of, let's say this approach was there anything that you learned that you're just like, oh, wow, that was so convincing. Like, this is, I can never look at it the same way again. Was there something in the Torah that stuck out to you in particular? Many things, many, many, many things. I'll say, you know, my approach originally was Rabbi Kiva Tatz was, was scratching my itch the most before Rabbi Foreman, oh. mostly because I was really interested in someone who would tell me the reason behind things. And Rabbi Tatz, uh, and a couple of others at, at Or Sameach as well. Rabbi David Gottlieb, I think, was someone who I really appreciated of course, of course. His, his approach, uh, super rational. Um, but anybody who would just tell me why was someone I appreciated. Rabbi Foreman wasn't purporting to tell me why anything, but he did. Like all, the end of pretty much all of his pieces then tell you why we do what we do or or why certain pieces of Torah are there. But the reason why I think it, it, it blew me away the most is because the meaning was emerging from Torah text itself, as opposed to meaning coming from a Rishon or an Achron or some, you know, Sefer in Kabbalah. It, I'm reading Psukim, black on white. This is the letter that God has purported to have written. Yeah. The meaning is not being projected into the text. It's yeah. coming from within. Yeah. And, and it's not a Vort either. Like uh, yeah. Vort in Aleph Beta is a dirty word, right? It's not something we don't. <laughs> It, it, the worst thing you can accuse somebody of is a, of, of a vort, right? Because <laughs> the idea of a vort is a nice idea that nobody really believes is true. Whereas Rabbi Foreman in the Aleph Beta based Medrash, like when your piece is done, Rabbi Foreman uh, hurls at you what we call the bet your house test, right? Which is, would you bet your house on this interpretation of these evidentiary points you're seeing in the Torah, wow. right? Like, so we really need to come up with an argument we think is accurate, not something that feels merely like a nice idea. And and a nice idea is like if I tell you a, a Dvar Torah in shul and the punchline is, and this is why you should love your parents, or this is why you should give tzedakah, nobody's going to come and say, you idiot, don't give tzedakah, right? Like everyone will accept whatever you say because it's a nice moral. But when you're reading something in the text and you feel like that's what the text was saying all along, that's an entirely different feeling. I don't know why this is coming to mind right now, but like I remember learning with a reformin, um, the idea behind Sukkot. What, what does Sukkot celebrate? So Sukkot, growing up, like everybody told me that, that the holiday of Sukkot celebrates the, uh, there's a machlokas, if it's the Ananea Kavod or Sukkos Mamash, right? It's like, even Exactly. 
which is crazy because there's no machlokas about what Pesach celebrates. And like some people say it's the exodus from Egypt and others say it's the exodus from Japan, right? That's not, <laughs> we don't have a machlokas about that because it's black on white in biblical text, what it celebrates. Um, not to mention the fact that you know, the opinion of Sukkos Mamash is a weird opinion. Like why would we have a holiday that celebrates sitting in a bunch of huts? And um, even the Ananiya Kavod, thing is a difficult answer because like, okay, there's the man and there's a whole bunch of other stuff that we don't seemingly have a holiday for. So what is Sukkot really? And then when you ask that question, it sort of ruins your Sukkot, right? Like, what am I doing here? I built this weird fiberglass thing with a bunch of like bamboo stuff on it. I'm supposed to eat in it. And so you resort to like all the halachic stuff of like, you know, I'll eat under this part and, you know, the women don't have to eat in it. And so they're, they're under the part that the schach isn't so perfect under. And I'm so, like, it's just like a weird thing. So the meaning really matters. And I remember, you know, learning with Rabbi Foreman and, and us discovering this kind of together where it says, you know, um, what is it? It's, um, Laman Yedu Dor Techem. Right? The reason we keep Sukkot is so you remember uh, because I settled you in Sukkot in my taking you out of um, uh, of Egypt. So something strange about that verse. You remember that I uh, you're going to celebrate Sukkot because you should remember in my taking you out of Egypt. What's strange about that verse? Or what would you have expected it to say? While you were in the desert? And while you were in the it, desert. Yeah. Sorry. Yes, right? It should should have said that. Didn't say that. It said, well, you know, in my taking you out of Egypt. Okay, so that was interesting. So we decided to take a look, of, look at it a little bit closer. And you go and you look, and you realize something really strange. That night of Makas Bechoros, that night of the Korban Pesach, when they leave Egypt, they encamp in a place. That place is called... Sukkot. Sukkot. Wow. Right. In my actually taking you out of Egypt, they go to a place called Sukkot. So it seems like the Torah is referencing that night. All, and then we have a huge problem. And the huge problem is it's the wrong holiday. Right. <laughs> like we already have a Pesach holiday. But if you read the Psukim, what do they do in Sukkot? In Sukkot, they didn't have enough time for the bread to rise. So they bake their dough and it turns into matzah. Like that's literally what's happening on that night of Sukkot is the whole matzah story. So it, it was just like this crazy, um, uh, upsetting research problem because it, it seemed like you cannot deny the fact that the Torah is clearly pointing you to that night. Um, and then we put together a whole nice piece and it's on Aleph Beta and you, we go into it more if you like, or you can take a look at it there. But basically arguing that the Torah sends you back to that night in two different ways. Right, the night of Pesach um, is is something we commemorate, particularly in in our taking a break from bread, or really taking a break a break from chametz. Right? It's that aspect of of um, creative activity um, in the time of the spring, and then the Torah. This, I know you guys are into Stoicism, but the, the Torah then has you go back and take a break from shelter. Right, so the, the Torah actually. Um, uh, there's a whole theory we have about how man um, in in their creativity can distance themselves from the creator, right? We process things. We process bread uh, when originally man is hunter-gatherer or man is connected to God directly and they can pick a, an apple and know exactly where this came from. But the fact that we take wheat and we process it and process it by making chametz and turn it into some other entire thing completely distances you from the creator. So for one week out of the year on Pesach, we actually turn our back on the civilization that invented chametz. And actually, uh, to get into so much more here, we turn our back on the civilization that uh, in expressing its dominance, um, enslaved so many others. So we, we turn our back on that modality around Pesach time. But then there's this whole other thing, which is shelter. We turn our backs uh, on, or we don't turn our backs, but we take a break from man's dominance over shelter, where we process space itself. The idea of inside and outside is a ridiculous idea to animals. It, do, it, doesn't, it doesn't exist. The whole world is outside. The whole world is God's world. But the fact that I right now think of myself in my office, in my house, right? That distances you from God. It distances you from source. Um, and so for one week out of the year, you take a break from shelter. Um, 
So these two ideas kind of come together around around uh, Pesach and Sukkot, and they're separated in time. They're separated. You have one in event in Nisan, you have another event in Tishrei. They're seven seven months apart, uh, essentially, and they both um, are two different um, rests from bricks and bread, as we call them in Aleph Beta. These are are cool ideas. That idea totally changed Sukkot for me completely, um, and we have a whole way in which it reconciles with us. Uh, Ananiya Kavod and Sukhas Mamash won't get into it, but um, I actually want to give a, I actually want to give a shout out to a book that Bensi uh, got me uh, into, which was it's a book called Rendezvous with God on all the holidays. It's written. Oh, I think you would like that even Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Nathan Laufer. Oh, he actually God. he analyzes like the meaning and the origins of every holiday through the pshat. It's Emo, I think you would really love that. You would I, love that, and Nathan, I know you probably know a lot of stuff. I'm yeah. embarrassed to tell you this, but. You should give it a try. Basically, oh, Magid Publishing. Any, check it out. Almost, almost anything by Magid Publishing is amazing, and and like they're kind of doing what you guys are doing on on like Nach, and you're they're doing it. I mean, they're doing it on the whole Torah, obviously. But like, I, I actually wanted to know if you guys are gonna eventually, when you do a bunch of cycles on the Parsha, do you guys want to expand into other areas as well? Like, let's say, good question. Doing good question. like, for example, like the works of uh, the, you know, for example, the Gemara or the Rambam or. Well, you guys do a gadita, that I know. You guys have done a gadita. Yeah. So the truth is, that, believe it or not, there's plenty more in in Torah to do and Tanakh. I think Nach is the great expansion. Rabbi Foreman and I are flirting a lot with um with this project that Rabbi Foreman calls the One Tanakh Project, which is basically to do a piece on every chapter in Tanakh and show how Tanakh wow. is is an integrated whole. How really all chapters, it's like the original internet. Rabbi Foreman likes to call it. Everything hyperlinks to each other. And you mm -hmm. can't really understand each safer orphaned on its own. Like it, it's connected to so many other pieces. So that's one of the other vistas we're super into. Right now, um, our main focus, or my foreman has this new podcast called The Book Like No Other, mm -hmm. um, which is doing really well, thank God. And it's basically wherever my foreman wants to go. One of the exciting things about it is that up until now, we sort of confine our foreman to Parsha and Holidays. This is Rabbi Foreman on whatever it is that he wants to teach about. The first um, season was about um, the two trees in Eden and a really controversial theory that those two trees are really one, that actually there, there were not two trees, that the, the Eitz Hadas Tovarah and the Eitz Hachayim is really one tree um, and all the implications of that. So it's an amazing piece. Um, and then the next season, I believe, is going to be on Tzedek and Mishpat. Um, so it's actually a bit about Sodom, about it, it takes us to Devarim, it takes us to Shlomo Amalek, it's kind of all over uh, Torah. And that's something that we're, we're excited to do, which is show how the themes in Torah, they're not, they're not really constructed around <laughs> Chagim so neatly. They're, they're constructed around, um, well, they, 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 they unveil themselves all throughout Tanakh. So we're, we're kind of giving ourselves the, the ability to chase that. And then there's a new podcast um, that we're working on that we haven't announced. So this is an exclusive for you guys, um, but it's a podcast that I'm going to be, um, uh, that I'm working on, and it's called Meaningful Judaism. Um, and uh, it's basically going to explore a popular mitzvah or uh, a major Jewish idea and understand the meaning behind it using biblical text as the source. So What's the meaning behind tzitzis? What's the meaning behind mikvah? Very why needed. Do we do why do we do kashras? All those pieces, but using exclusively biblical text. To that's to very needed. Life. Very, very needed. I think that's going to be really cool. And, uh, you know, I, I just want to tell you, when I started learning, uh, learning, when I started listening, I guess you can call it learning too. When I started listening to Aleph Beta, um, up until that point in my life, to be brutally honest, um, shot didn't exist for me, literally. Um, it's almost like um, when I would look at the text, it was empty, literally empty, um, because I never, I was never even given, not even a little bit of a of a taste of of what it means to study pshat. Pshat was basically, you know, glorified midrashim, you know at some, you know, mystical ideas or just taking it extremely literally, which is also in some sense what I mean, like just taking like, you know, for what it says and that is it. Mm -hmm. to, to, 
to get any umkoshal pshutoshal mikre in the words of the Rashpan. Right, the Rashpan uses that term umkoshal pshutoshal mikre, the depth of the pshutoshal mikre. I didn't even know it existed. When I started um, listening to Aleph Beta, it was like it was like finding like something that you never even knew existed before. What you guys are doing um, is changing the Jewish world because I don't think that anybody can turn on Aleph Beta, go on Aleph Beta and ever look at the Torah the same way. Doesn't, doesn't mean that they necessarily agree or disagree with every conclusion or idea, but it does mean that I think that when someone goes on to Aleph Beta and he sees what you guys are doing and how the text is being brought to life and what I th- I call what Aleph Beta does um koshal kshutoshal mikre, right? I think that uh, I don't think anyone can look at the Torah the same way after. So I, I just want to like say that I think that um, this is a extremely important project that you guys uh, began okay. doing, and I think that it's going to grow and and like. Yeah. A lot of lives have been changed from Aleph Beta, just Thank from you. the way they approach the Torah, simply enough. So, Thank you. Um, you know, I don't know, that I, I kind of put lot. that in there. There was no flow or anything. I apologize, but I just wanted to get that out. I wanted to let that out. So, um, no, I, you, I appreciate you, it. Sure. And you you did have a discussion regarding Rabbi Foreman's new podcast. You actually sent an email where you were you were discussing with him about uh, earlier on about uh, how to view the text. And I kind of found that to be really interesting. And I wanted to know if you're willing to tell that to the viewers, that whole. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to. Yeah. So, so it's funny because um, Rabbi Foreman and I have a, a healthy work tension um, between us and, and we sort of view the mission of Aleph Beta differently. Um, Rabbi, I'll say me, um, it's easier to explain and maybe even understand my approach. My approach is, is really I want to change the world. I want everyone to fall in love with Torah, to be moved by its values, to uh, become good people because of the mitzvos. I I think that we have really great explanations for so much, uh, so many of the mitzvos, like weird mitzvos, like Hilayim and Shatnez, uh, or uh, you know, you just the depth to tzitzis that people don't fathom or explaining why there are weird law weird um stories in the torah right like the the rape of dina and the massacre of shrem or the sin of ham just like strange stuff that if i were writing a bible i might not have included um but so i want to scream that from the rooftops that's really exciting for me um rabbi foreman cares a lot less about changing the world um, and in fact, he has accused me many, many times of being um, too, he calls it, uh, you know, messianic, right? Like you can't <laughs> think about changing the world. It's something he's taught me many, many times. Um, what he's interested in is something that I think is boring, which is being an honest interpreter of biblical text. That's really important to him. And when he describes the mission or the, you know, of Aleph Beta, I'm like, I want to show everyone the truth. And he's like, no, let's show everybody how beautiful this text is. I was like, what does that mean? Show everybody how beautiful the text is. He's like, well, it's just like it weaves its meaning so intricately and so beautifully and elegantly. Isn't it elegant? And I'm like, yeah, it's elegant, but who cares? Like, what does it mean? Why is it relevant? How is it going to change my life? And he's like, no, like don't that that comes second. It's not the it's not the important piece. And that tension between us has so many implications. Like. I want to fundraise for it and I want to tell everyone what we're doing. And he's like, you know what? Like people will get it or they won't get it. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure what's where specifically you want me to go with this. I can tell you for, for me personally, he has convinced me a, that, you know, my instinct around mission certainly is a little immature. Um, and I think his is more successful in the long run. I think, you know, you talked about how Aleph Beta does this or that, or if you come to Aleph Beta, you'll be blown away. It's not us. It's the text. And and if you think it's us, then Aleph Beta's legacy lives and dies with us. I, I don't, right? Like, that's not what we want. What excites us most is that people open the biblical text and expect it to mean something to them. 
you know, we don't use the word pshat in Aleph Beta. You talked about pshat many times. We don't make distinctions between pshat and drash. Like it's that's not in our lexicon because the heart of our methodology is simply reading the text and expecting it to either make sense or you, you just read the text and see what is it trying to tell, to tell you? Like what, if you, if you pay close attention, um, what's the leading word? What's the pattern you notice? Why is it being repetitive? You know, we have this instinct already that if the Torah is repeating itself, you could probably find a chiasm, mm -hmm. um, right? If you realize that uh, in Pilegesh Begiva, uh, the concubine is cut into 12 pieces and you read just a few more chapters into Sefer Shmuel and you realize that when Shaul is trying to unite the kingdom and he cuts that ox into 12 pieces, right? Like th these, these stories are playing off of one another. The, the fact that Shaul comes from Binyamin, which is just almost wiped out, is remarkable. Like it's it's crazy that they were going to wipe that shavit out, and now the king comes from that shavit. These stories are and amazing. Asked, and he's asked to wipe out a nation. It's yeah, like, almost like now he's put in a position where he he kind of like he he has to protest in his in his mind. Yes, and and he has to 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 keep his people together, and and they have to deal with the the Amalekite threat, and it, it, it's the the stories are really rich when. At least I'm speaking about my background. My background is like taking a bin binoculars and pointing it at a line of text and then moving the binoculars to the next pasuk and the binoculars to the next pasuk. And like, you need to widen your lens, <laughs> put a yeah. few psukim under your belt and just read closely and expect this text to make sense. So I really appreciate like the innovation that you guys are doing. I actually, our personal rabbi, uh, Rabbi Joshua Maruf, I don't know if you heard his episodes, but he's phenomenal. He... He actually, he's like not tech savvy and he doesn't care about, he doesn't care about fanfare or anything like that. We always try to push him, but he started doing this thing called the Midrash HaShavua mm -hmm. and eventually, hopefully he's going to write a book on it. But um, the Midrash HaShavua is instead of us reading the Torah and then trying to understand the Midrashim that come from the, you know, are connected to the Psukim, he actually finds very obscure Psukim. He asks us in like a chat. Find me a, you know, Midrash, Genesis Rabbah or whatever, something interesting that's just very strange and out there. And then he'll he'll write a beautiful interpretation connecting it to the Torah, but in such a way that you're like, I can't believe, like, I never even picked up on such a thing. This is a, yeah. like, I always thought this was just the craziest idea. Um, so I feel like, you know, the innovators today are finally having their day. Um, I think that the, the, there's a if you go walk into a farm store and you see you know it used to be you walk into the farm store and everything's like kind of like Hasidic books. Um, that was when I was growing up. You see a lot of that yeah. today. It's like it's all it's all like the you know Magid publishing and Rabbi Sachs and and Rabbi Foreman and there's just like this thirst for um, this kind of innovative um, looking at the original sources. So I think that you, it's just I, I have no words really to to. Say what you guys isn't doing. isn't it funny how you use innovative and original sources in the same breath? Because I, I it's it's funny because I actually see this as mostly originalism. I think it's a return to and this is where Rabbi Foreman will call me messianic, but I think sort of the original values and spirit of Judaism has been lost and is now being recovered. Because yeah. I think that the, the Judaism that's there under the surface, that was always there under the surface, is a much more inspirational um and i don't know a whole uh meaningful judaism than the one that i was taught and the one that i was taught wasn't wrong or bad it's just an aspect of something that i think is just far more vibrant the other thing that i would say just in response to your comment you know one of the other things where my foreman does not like to be complimented the word he doesn't like is is creative use the word innovative <laughs> right because creativity implies that I think, you know, for my foreman, the, the, the compliment that he most likes is, you know, you're like a, a, an archaeologist, right? Because that, that's what we think of ourselves as doing, is uncovering something that's there rather than inventing something that's not. Right. Um, and, and you can too, right? Like, that's also the part of it is like, yeah. if what we were doing felt like we were creating it, then you'd be enjoying someone else's creativity. The way we try to style our pieces in a way in which your mind is following what we're doing. Like, you, you're like, I, I did a poor job of it tonight, but when I stopped and I said, what was, 
weird about this Pasuk and you told me what it should have said in the Midbar and it actually says in Sukkot. That's what we're trying to do is lead you to the same noticings that we had. And that's what makes it compelling, I think. Because if we were making something up, you would just have to nod and smile. Right. And that that we really you know resonate with that because in a way what we're trying to do is bring people back to the fundamentals. Yeah. You know, I feel like as somebody, both of us went to Yeshiva and we feel like that's what we didn't get. We got everything but the fundamentals. Yeah. Exactly. So, and, and that's not why, why do you why do you think that is? Um, I think that it's a f- number of factors. We we discuss it in a few episodes, even with um, Rabbi Mark Wilds, and just kind of how the yeshiva I heard that episode. Yeah, just how the yeshiva uh-huh. system is set up, and um, I think that there's just this was the this was the way that it was in America, and no one's come and kind of try to change it, um, and we're just kind of stuck with the same format. But um, you're learning. We're kind of splitting our day with. with you know, Torah and secular studies, and with more of a focus on secular studies. So we also have to teach the Hebrew language, and there's all these other things we have to do. So by the time we get to like third or fourth grade, we they feel like we can't learn Chumash anymore, and we got to jump to Mishnah, you got to jump to Gemara, and you kind of miss out on understanding like the basics, the fundamentals, which are you know Chumash um, and Midrash. You're you're learning well, it in a very superficial way. I have a much more evil and cynical take do you want to hear my evil and cynical yeah. take this is the right I, I think great I, I think that the reason why you know the the classic yeshiva way of teaching is is really an emphasis on dogma and an emphasis on halacha and an emphasis on skills more than an emphasis on values is because the values aren't that great and nobody really knows what the values are and they're terrified to actually teach them because they don't stand up to scrutiny and I think that's what you guys are doing on this podcast is you're actually saying, no, no, there are people out there who are well thought out and who apply scrutiny and, you know, uh, who, who have something worthwhile to say. But I think that um, that hasn't caught on on the mainstream yet. And I think that that is the most threatening thing to modern orthodoxy, actually, is that in a world of Internet and endless, um, like I can access the entire corpus of human knowledge in the palm of my hand, yeah. right? If, if I can do that, then you need to teach a Judaism that can stand up to that. So so in defense of, you know, the yeshiva rebbe's, you know, they're not getting paid a lot of money and the, so therefore maybe not getting the same quality of rebbe. Um, my, I have relatives in Israel who are Haredi and it's 10 times worse there because, you know, if you ask any questions, They'll shun you. They'll hit you even sometimes in some extreme schools. And they're just not used to it because they're not equipped to deal with these kind of questions. Frankly, a lot of them aren't educated. So we're kind of, you know, in a between a rock and a uh, what's the phrase? A hard, hard place. place. Hard place. Exactly. So, you know, it's I, I feel like there needs to be like kind of an overhaul on the whole system. And we kind of have to learn um, a new a new way of doing things. I think I think one way we can fix things is by, and I think we don't give children enough credit. Children are able to grasp, because I was always told this, your child won't understand me, Josh. Why, like, like you just have to teach them very black and white. And I started from a young age. Every time my kids came home with a midrash and they were like, this is what happened. I said, what do you think they're really trying to say? What do you think the you know, Chazal is trying to teach us there? It's a riddle. And when it, once I told them it was a riddle, it like opened their mind up and they were like, they were, they were like coming up with theories and breaking their heads and they loved it. And they came back to their teachers and sometimes their teachers would be like, you know, your, your dad is wrong, you know, (laughs) but I get that. I get that too from my kid who knows way too much Aleph Beta Torah in the first grade. Yeah. (laughs) Right. But, but you know, even though they said your, your, your dad is wrong, I don't agree with your dad. Sometimes they said, Oh, I never thought of it that way. That's interesting. And and they liked that my kids did that. They liked that they didn't have the cookie cutter answer that, you know, everyone else was given. Like they were taught, I was trying to teach them how to think, not not what to think. So um, I think that's another thing that's lost in, in the yeshiva world is that like, we're not really, ta- when it comes to Torah, we're, we're not really taught how to think, to think of chidushim, to think of new ideas. But when it comes to Gemara and all that and halacha, you know, it's, you know, you can question things. You can challenge and you can ask questions. Well, when it comes to everything else, you can't. They're, they're, we close the, the book. 
So I think that, you know, these conversations that we're having and with all of our other guests, hopefully it's going to inspire change in, in the yeshiva world. I, I, I think um, the distinction here actually is really about fear. Because the reason why you can question whatever you want to in Gemara is because it's a closed system. Yeah. And so long as you look a certain way and you keep certain things, you don't question the root of the system. But within that closed system, you're questioning, do whatever you want. Nobody cares. Yeah. Right. Um, now, strangely, in, the, in Judaism, this is everybody thinks that fear justifies everything. That, oh, they might go off the derech, so don't ask. Or don't expose. The Yerushalayim card. The Yerushalayim yeah. card. Sure. The Yerushalayim card. <laughs> But I think that in the places where you could otherwise be afraid, if you turn around and you have um, bravery, those are the places where you actually instill a tremendous sense of security. If your kid knows it's safe to ask any questions, what you said is like, I'm not trying to tell my kid what to do, but I'm teaching them how to think, right? Well, they might think themselves into another religion. And if you're okay with that, strangely, your kid actually trusts you a lot more if they know you're not boxing them into something. I think that's something our generation yes. really needs in response to millennials and maybe even even um, Gen Z. Like we, we need to know no one is forcing us into this and that actually critical thinking led us to where we we are. But I think that it, it comes from, uh, I think everybody wild said this, I'm not sure, but like it, it does go back to the enlightenment, I think, where like once you give Jews the, a choice, Many, many times they'll choose otherwise. And the Haredi response is to not give them the choice. And the modern Orthodox response has to be, I think, um, that actually you can continue to choose. And and this is and, and, and to teach a Judaism that is compelling enough to choose and to be okay with the fact that some people are not going to choose it. That, that's my take totally on with it. You. I'm totally with you. And I, I have to do this because I was noticing on your wall is that an enneagram diagram? It is. I oh, used so to study impressed. the enneagram. I used to study you the used enneagram. To. Yeah. Well, I I studied it a lot. I mean, I, I I can pretty much discuss it with you all you want now if you want. Uh, but uh, I was just noticing, and I noticed this is the one through nine, and then reformer, helper, achiever, and I'm like, oh my god, is that enneagram? So I had to do that. Sorry. <laughs> I'm obs- I, I I I the the enneagram is something I'm obsessed with. And actually, it was also introduced to me by way of Rabbi Foreman. Um, but uh, his his was just like a passing hobby. But the Enneagram is a little embarrassing. It's a personality system that um, that I don't understand its basis in like rationality. But it, I find its explanatory power to be really, really compelling. Um, so I'm a big fan. Yeah. it's a, can, can I take a guess of what you think you are? Yeah, go ahead. I'm on the fence between three and seven. Oh, wow. I'm neither one of those. Three, I'm flattered by, but no, not. Uh, <laughs> I like threes. My wife is a three, so I'm a, I'm a three okay. fan. Okay. No, I'm an Enneagram one, a reformer. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So those if are... you read my my email of me and Rabbi Foreman, the, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of changing the world. Like that's the... Uh, the classic one thing and a reformant is a five which means he's he investigator believes. inquisitive exactly scientist i got you really uh, cool I wonder, I wonder. really really cool <laughs> this is going over your head <laughs> okay <laughs> nothing don't worry this is i've, uh, I've heard this real many times so have well, you really yeah from bensi and we have another friend Aton, who's right into it also or he was at least back in the day so they they would they would analyze people together all that oh this this guy's a seven and He's a he's a six wing or something. It was a very immature type of yeah, way of yeah. going into the near game. Yeah, yeah. You're usually not serious. supposed to just type type <laughs> other people, but I, I use it a lot in, in coaching. It, it's very useful. Yes, I it know. is. No, if on a serious yeah. note, it, it does give people I, I think that it's important because some people, when they're able to, you know, put a certain uh, when they can connect or relate to a certain one of the numbers and then understand the healthy and the intermediate and the unhealthy and kind of give them a, a roadmap towards being healthy in their own way. It's very important. Ones, very, very ones important. are ones are very judgmental people. So this is this is me. Um and to me this really saved my relationship with the right foreman because early on I kept trying to make him me. Like that's what we all do um instinctively is you try mm-hmm. and, and have everybody make the same decisions you make. The reason we get angry at someone else is you're like 
you idiot. Why didn't you use my lens on life? Right. And that's what we do is we just like, if you were more like me, then you would be good. And the Enneagram is sort of this way of saying like, well, they're not you. Rabbi Foreman's a five. He doesn't care about reforming the world. He cares yeah. about coming up with secret knowledge. That's the thing he's into. And once I let him be and he let me be, well, we build this really awesome thing together. Like he gives me space to go and change the world. And I give him the space that he needs to come up with more secret knowledge. And that that partnership only happened once I knew who he was and who I was. Absolutely. Totally understand you. Beautiful. This is a really beautiful. beautiful example of a Rebbe student relationship. And um, I want to thank you so much for coming on. This was amazing. And I before you we go, I, I'd like for you to plug your coaching so we can hear a little bit more, more about that. Yeah, I don't need to plug it too much. It's really more of a hobby more than anything else. It's just something that, um, you know, the, the things that you do, you could do them at nine o'clock at night and not feel tired doing them. Um, so for me, that's, that's coaching. I really enjoy, um, talking to other people, finding their superpowers. What are they really strong at? Um, a big principle of, of coaching that I like to use is to try not at all to work on your weaknesses, which is like what brings people to coaching in the first place. They're often looking for a coach to try and make them be more disciplined or to try to find some, ex I call it externalized violence right? Who, how can I have somebody like hold the sword over my head and make me be more productive? Whereas what I like to try and do is find out who you are, like uh, what, are, what are your superpowers? What are your strengths? And let go of the things that you're bad at. And I like to, uh, to show people how you can partner with others to, for, you know, to find your compliment, find something that you're, you're great at. So it's something I enjoy a great deal. It's something that I do really in my spare time. <laughs> I'll say that takes more than my full-time hours. Uh, is, that, is that like more like business coaching or life coaching? Yes and yes. So I do um, I do plenty of business coaching. I do life coaching as well. My favorite coaching is actually working with business partners. Um, so exactly what I just described to you with me and my foreman where I'm the one and he's the five. Um, that same partnership, um, I, I try to help partners stop trying to change one another and accept one another appreciate and respect one another and recognize why did you get into this in the first place the relationships um, marriage all that also works yeah I, I i would love to do some marriage counseling i think that anytime it gets super serious you should see a, a, a real professional but uh <laughs> it doesn't stop me from wanting to stick my nose into other people's business but uh yeah that, that's my bit wow this was something this we really enjoyed this conversation i, I could speak on Betsy's behalf i'm sure um and i wanted to thank you again this uh, hopefully we'll have this ready for you shortly. And uh, we're excited to get this out there because, you know, we're, you're putting out the Mashiach energy. So. <laughs> well, thank you guys for having me. Like I said to you guys both, I really do think that um, the, the thing, I, I mean, if you take a look at just like the, the corpus of what it is that you put out already, like you guys have put out a serious amount of incredible thought work and Torah um, so you, you really should give yourselves a tremendous shkayach. but I think even more than that, what I really appreciate about you guys is your fearlessness. Like the fact that you're willing to ask the big questions, um, and delve into, um, in, into, uh, scary territory is I think exactly what the world needs now. And, um, and more than anything, thanks for giving me a, a little soapbox. That was fun. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much. Emo. Hopefully we'll get a chance to do it again. Absolutely. All right, take care.